Well, hey, y'all, good morning. morning. Welcome to the 10 o'clock service. (laughs) So (laughs) you should have seen us at the 8 o'clock service. That proves why we proved an hour ago why we do not have an 8 o'clock service. Um, So 8 o'clock service in the midst of a coronavirus outbreak even. So it's been quite a day. Um, So um, uh, where am I? What am I going to talk about? I know what I'm going to talk about. Um, I want to remind you of a couple things. First of all, the 2513 pledge. uh, I want to remind you of that. Basically, for those of you that don't know, $25 a week above and beyond your tithes or $1,300 for the whole year. That's the same number if you do the math. Uh, We're asking people to do that to help us plant a church, uh, plant a new church in Waldorf, and then ultimately plant another church as well in Waldorf or beyond. We're not exactly sure where that one's going yet, but... uh, that one's two years out. In the next two years, we plant two churches. Hey, let me tell you a story. I just came back from the um, from the exponential conference uh, uh, where you know Tina and I had a very small role there, and um, and so we came, just came back. And the exponential conference is trying to say to the entire church universal that we need to multiply plant churches. Now we've been saying this for twenty years, but twenty years ago when they first started saying this, uh, and we were saying this, one percent of churches planted churches, only one percent. They are shooting for 10% of churches planting churches, which will help us to have a movement, right? They have now moved to the best statistics they can find from 1% to 6%. That's a huge, uh, that's a huge gain over the past 10 years, and they are moving toward 10%. We've been at this for a lot of years. It's wonderful to now hear somebody say it in the entire, in the entire church. And by the way, in our case, this fall, we will plant a church, and all three of our church plants will also plant a church. We got four coming out in, all across Southern Maryland this fall. Come on now. That's God moving. That's God moving. So I just want to praise the Lord for that, and I want to encourage you. We told you to pray, plan, and then pledge. We've given you time to pray. We've given you time to plan, to, to plan. And so if you have not made your pledge yet, go ahead and do that. Let somebody know about it. Email us. You can do it online. You can do whatever you want to with that. But go ahead and do that. I will also let you know we're on our sermon series on uh, taking authority over our identity. We have a book that partners with this series. If you want to grab that, it's in the, it's in the store back there, along with New Life Swag that will make you look as good as me. <laughs> I know, I didn't sell anything just now. It's all right. Uh, So uh, let me ask the ushers to come forward to help us with tithes and offerings. And while they're coming, let me pray for us. Father God, thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing and all you're going to do. Now, Lord, would you take the commitment of every tither and the generosity of everyone that brings an offering, put those together and help us play the role you have for us. Thank you, God, for what you let us do and for letting us partner with you. We give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 You guys can go ahead. All right, we've been talking about taking authority over our identity. And, and w- what I want you to do is I want you to draw this, all right? I, I would like for you to, I'd like for everybody to take your hand out and draw this because I want you to learn how to draw this because you're going to have to preach this to somebody. You're going to have to teach this to somebody. There's going to be somebody in your life that needs this lesson, and you're not going to be able to say, man, I'd like to get you to Pastor Mike. That's not going to work for you because you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to need to teach it, and you can. You can do this. This is not tough. This requires zero artistic ability, all right? You can draw a circle, right? If you can draw a circle, you can draw this, all right? So I I want you to learn this, because we're talking about I am, our identity. Let me remind you of something. My I am will determine my I will. You need to know that. My I am will determine my I will. Listen to it another way. My identity will determine my destiny. Even though God has a destiny set for me, if I refuse to receive the identity he has made me for, I will never achieve the destiny he made me for. If I insist on an incorrect identity, then I will not achieve the correct destiny destiny. My I am determines my I will. My identity determines my destiny because my I am sets my truth. All right. Now I want you to, I want you to understand something. You got to hear me. Even if the label, the identity I have received is a lie. Once I receive it, that lie becomes my truth. All right, you need to understand that. You need to understand that even a lie can become my truth if I receive it as my identity, if I accept it, if I allow that label to take hold, the lie will become my truth. 
Okay, well, so how can a lie become the truth? Because if you accept it internally, watch, your truth that you accept will, will affect the way you think. When you accept an internal truth about yourself, it affects the way you see and think about the rest of the world. Watch, if I have, if I have a defective truth about me, then I begin to view the world through a defective lens. And so I'm not seeing the world properly. I will actually begin to view the world in a way that, 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 that verifies the lie that I've received as my truth. And even though it's a lie, I'll receive it and I'll see the world from the vantage point of that lie that I've allowed to become the lens in my life. It changes the way we think. The way I think will affect the way I act. Eventually, you will act out of the way you think. If you think a certain way, if your mind, if, you, if, if this is your truth, and you see the world through this lens, even if it's a distorted lens, if you see the world this way, if this is the way you think, this is the way you have your truth, and you see the world that way, it will change your actions. It will change what you do. And if you have a lie as your truth and a distorted lens as your thinking, you will act out in the world in ways that are not healthy for you or anyone else around you. And you will not achieve what God has called you to. You will instead mess things up where God means for you to make a difference. Okay? So that's our actions. Our actions then establish our habits. And our habits will then harden like concrete around our feet the identity we've taken for ourselves, even if it's a lie. You need to understand that. So many people have received a lie in their lives and they've allowed that lie to become their truth. It's shifted their thinking. It's, it's infected their actions. And now they're caught in a habit that is born out of a lie. Y'all, y'all, somebody look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. Tell your neighbor, all right? Because the truth is that we've got to receive who God made us to be, not who we... Now listen, once you get caught in this habit, and again, let me remind you, a habit is, a habit is good for you. If it's not good for you, we don't call it a habit. We call it an addiction. And like I said a few weeks ago, nobody says, I, 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 I'm addicted to vegetables. <laughs> nobody says that. And nobody says, I have a healthy habit of liquor. I didn't get enough laugh out of that. I don't like the way that went. Y'all all right? The truth is, this will affect us. Now watch. Once that concrete of your identity has hardened around your feet, in the right settings, it can drown you. And you truly are trapped. There's no way you can get out. You say, well, 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 where's the hope? The hope, stay with me, don't get mad at me. The hope is not in you. The hope is outside you. The hope is the Holy Spirit. Because what God wants to do is he wants to bring the supernatural to intersect your natural. And he wants to change it. God will break through your I am and change it and reset your identity to the place he wants it to be. And trust me, you want to be where he wants you to be, okay? You can teach this to somebody because quite frankly, let me tell you something. Every single one of you knows somebody that needs this truth. You say, well, I can't tell them that. If I tell them that, they'll think I don't like them. No, if you tell them that they are more than what they think they are, they'll understand that you love them and you view them in a higher level than they even view themselves. Yeah. Because God can help them break the pattern they are trapped in. Now, we've been teaching this out of Nehemiah. And in, in, in Nehemiah, we've talked through already the fact that Nehemiah is a slave to the king in the capital city. He's never been to Jerusalem. However, he hears of the problem in Jerusalem. He's crushed by it. He's broken, but God wants to make him the answer. He's just the help, but God wants to make him the hero. All of this is true of Nehemiah. Now we're in chapter 2. So if you want to follow along, we're going to read Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 10 through 18. And I'm going to show them on the screen. But if you want to read along, that's where we're going to be, all right? So look, 
Verse, it starts here. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Let me explain. Sanballat and Tobiah are the leaders of two other city-states that exist around Jerusalem. Here's what's going on. When Jerusalem, when the inhabitants of Jerusalem, when they begin to have a, let's say they have a bumper crop, they have a lot of crops, they've now stored up grain, they have extra. They've stored up some wealth, they have extra. They've got a savings account, they have extra. Whenever they have extra, Sanballat and Tobias send their forces and invade the city and steal whatever the residents of Jerusalem have saved up. That's why they're in distress. It's because there's no security. There's no wall. And every time they build up a little bit of hope, Sanballat and Tobiah come and steal it. Somebody stay with me. Somebody hear me out. Because what's happening in your life is the spiritual wall that protects your heart is broken down. And now every time you build up a little bit of hope, every time you build up a little bit of self-discipline, every time you make a little bit of progress, the devil sends his people in and they invade. And because there are no walls protecting you, he comes in and steals the hope and you're once again lost. That's what's happening in your life. And here's the deal. Whenever God starts rebuilding the walls around your life to protect you spiritually, it ticks off the devil. Sanballat and Tobiah are up very much disturbed that someone has come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. When God comes to promote the welfare of you, the devil don't like that. And he's going to be upset by that. I don't know why you talk about the devil. Well, because he's messing you up. That's why. Oh, you don't really believe in the devil. You believe in God? I'm just saying. There's, the, 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 there's a force of evil that is trying to take you. The Bible, Jesus tells Peter at one point, the devil wishes to sift you. You say, well, what, 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 I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. That's not, don't stop. And they like that. The devil's not going to like come in your, in your room, old red guy with horns and a pitchfork, hide up under your bed. And go, He's not going to do that. No, no, no. He just wants to make you make bad choices because he's not here to scare you. He's here to steal you. Y'all all right? He's not here to scare scare you. He's here to destroy you. The Bible says he came to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his goal. He's not looking to jump out from behind a bush or hide in your closet. (laughs) He's here to mess you up, and this is how he's going to do it. Okay, watch. They were upset, right? So I, this is Nehemiah, went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, didn't do anything, just came to Jerusalem, stayed, Staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others, and I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me, no other horses with him, except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate. Uh, y'all, I went, I went left and turned to the right and went around that way. That's what he's saying, all right? <laughs> Examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. He's overseeing. He's looking at. You remember, you remember when we told you about the 2513 plan? We want you to pray, plan, and then, and, and then pledge, right? He's prayed already. That was in chapter one. Now he's planning. You see it? So watch. Then I moved toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. Everybody listen. There will come places in your life where the debris of your failure is piled so high you can't even get through it. And you need to identify where those places are because those are the places that are going to require the most work. Do you see it? You say, you say, why are you doing this? We're talking about Jerusalem. You're talking about me. What are you doing? Y'all, it's the way I've told you to read the Old Testament over and over again. Here's the way you read this. You see Jerusalem and the people of Israel as an individual, not a nation. You see the Jerusalem as an individual, not a city. And what you will learn as you watch God deal with Jerusalem is you will learn how God desires to deal with you. He wants the walls that protect you spiritually, those spiritual walls, he wants them built back up so that the devil will stop invading your heart. He wants to give you some protection. 
And you need to look around your life and figure out where it's broken down and where the debris piled so high you can't even get through. Everybody all right? Watch. Then I turned back. Then, uh, so I went up, up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Why? Because he's prayed. Now he's planning. Watch. Now watch. Then I said to them. Somebody say then. Then, then I said to them. So now he's going to pledge. You see it? Pray. Plan, pledge. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we, he owns it with them. He does not have to do that. They're the ones that never rebuilt their wall. This is his first time in town. But rather than blame them, he joins them. All right, he says, look at the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. Watch. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. In other words, I've prayed, I've planned, I'm now gonna pledge, but I need you to know God's already on my side. You see it? Now the people are seeing what's going on. Now watch. I want to show you something. I am, Sanballat and Tobiah, everybody's against him. I am the last choice. I need you to understand that there are times when you are everybody's last choice. Y'all all all right? Say, no, I'm not. I'm always the first choice. (laughs) Okay. No, no, no. There are times when you're not the first choice. And, and listen, listen, Nehemiah is nobody's first choice. Sanballat and Tobiah do not want him here. They want him to go back. And you say, oh, but the people of Jerusalem, they're excited. No, they're not. The last thing the people that live in Jerusalem want is another emissary from another conquering king. They've been overrun by king after king after king after king. They have been beaten down and held down by king after king. And now there's another guy coming from the king and he's going to stand here. You know what he's going to say. He says, hi, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. (laughs) Yeah, that's not good. They don't want that. And by the way, he's never been here before. He ain't from here. He's got the wrong accent. You see it? He's the last choice. Watch I went to Jerusalem and stayed there for three days, did nothing. I was the last choice. Why? Because he was unprepared. Can I ask you a question? As the, remember, Nehemiah is cupbearer to the king. So let me modernize it. He is the king's bartender. As a bartender, how many walls around cities you suppose he's ever built? Let's go with none. How many full cities do you suppose he's ever managed? Let's go with none. He is unprepared. He is not ready for this. And he has to know that. Can I be honest? Sometimes God calls you to things and you're not prepared for them. And you know you're not prepared for them. And you're scared to even go try it because you know you're not prepared. But God's called you anyway. Watch. Oh, oh, let me show you something else. Then he says, I set out during the night with a few others. And he's got to overlook the thing. Why? Because he's also uneducated. He has no idea how to do this. You said, come on, pastor. It's not that hard. It's just build a wall. Well, okay, okay, maybe that's not a big deal. As long as all the ground you're building on is flat and the walls you're building are a perfect square. But here, have you ever been to Jerusalem? I, y'all, I can tell you, it's not flat. There are hills and valleys. And, and by the way, the wall around the city is not a straight line. Building this wall is gonna take some skill that he does not have. He doesn't even know what he's up against until he takes this ride at night and looks at the wall. He doesn't even understand what he's trying to build till he takes a look at it. So so, so he's unprepared, he's uneducated, and he had not told anybody what God had put in his heart to do. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. Unprepared, uneducated, and he is unknown. They do not know him. Why would anybody in the town follow him other than the fact that he's got a a whole regiment of the king's army with him? 
And that, y'all, does not, that might inspire people to work, but it does not inspire people to work, I don't know, wholeheartedly. He doesn't need them to be forced into building this wall. He needs them to understand that they are going to build this wall. Can I say something about this? This is not a lie. This is real. In everybody's life, you have a moment where this is absolutely real. And then the truth is, it's not that the devil's lying to you about this. It's that the devil keeps reminding you of this and keeps telling you that's where you're always going to be. What? Let, 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 me, let me tell you a story. Uh, I remember vividly the first Monday as a pastor. Monday. See, you have to understand that in, in, in pastor school, they teach, you, they teach you to write a sermon and preach. I knew how to do that. In pastor school, they teach you how to run a service. I knew how to do that. In pastor school, because I was also a musician, they taught me how to lead a choir. So, so you know, here's what happened. Bettina and I moved there, we unpacked all our stuff at the house, and then the weekend came, Sunday came, and I went and taught a Sunday school class, and I went and led the choir, and I preached, and it was Sunday, and it was awesome. <laughs> and then Monday came, and I was, man, I was ready. I got up, I went to the office early, gonna change the world! <laughs> and I got to the office, and I unlocked the door. Do you know why I unlocked the door? Let me give you a secret about small churches. Nobody goes to a small church on a Monday. Nobody shows up, and this was a small church. And I walked in, and there was nobody there. And I, had, I think I had my Bible in one book. And I walked in, and I laid my Bible in one book on this desk, and it was huge. And I laid it there, and I, and I, and I, and I sat down. You know how some of you have sat around going, what do pastors do all day? I was the pastor and I had that moment. <laughs> what do pastors do all day? And I sat there and I went, I was unprepared for Monday. I was uneducated on what to do with Monday. I was unknown. And well, you should call somebody, call the other pastors. They didn't know me. I just got here. I'm going to call somebody. Hey, I'm Pastor Mike. Who? Who's Pastor Mike? Well, uh, I'm down at the, the, this little old church. Well, where is that? They had no idea. Y'all, this was not. In fact, can I be honest? I was the last choice. Because they had, I, I had been turned down by a church, and they had been turned down by a pastor. I was truly the last choice. I was not their first choice. And so here we were. This was real. Y'all, in your life, you'll have moments where this is real. You say, well, if that's real, then that really is my identity. Well, sure it is until God breaks it. Amen. See, I got to tell you something. It started that way. I didn't know what to do with that first day, but I followed what God told me to do. I just kept listening to him, and I just, I just did whatever God told me. To. By the time I left that place, everybody in town knew my name. All the pastors knew who, who I was. All the pastors knew where that church was, and the church had doubled in size by the time we left that town. Not because I'm cool, but because God called. You hear it? It's not about the pastor. It's about the call of God. It's not about the person. It's about the call of God. It's not about you and your preparedness, your education, or, or your popularity. It's about the call of God. Amen. Because God will supernaturally intersect your reality and set you free. Watch. Your I am changes. You used to be the last choice, but now you're the best hope. That's what God wants to do with you. You say, well, how do you go from being the last choice to the best hope? I'm glad you asked. I want to show you. Watch. Here's how you do that. By night, I went through the valley gate toward the jackal wall, the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. I, then I moved toward, you, you see all this. What, let me show you something. Look around. Figure it out. Look around, look, look, look. Whether I'm talking about your workplace, your family, your neighborhood, or your life, take the time to look around. When I got there that first Monday, I sat behind my desk for a few minutes like this. I finished reading the book, put it down. And I just walked around. You know what I found out? 
The carpet in that place was rotting away from the corners of the wall. Have you ever seen carpet so old it's rotting away from the wall? Weirdest thing I've ever seen. And it was an old church. So how many of y'all have been in church? Raise your hand. How many of y'all have been in church more than 30 years? Raise your hand. Come on now. Y'all, y'all have seen lime green carpet. Because <laughs> in the 70s, every church put down lime green. I think it was cheap, and that's why they bought it. There was lime green and rotting out of the corners. This church had brick on the inside. It was kind of an odd design, but it's what they did. So lime green carpet, put this in your mind, lime green carpet, the brick was peach. I'm not done yet. There were walls of wood as well in this, in this place, and they were, they were they, y'all, stay with me. Don't get mad at me. They were painted booger snot gold. I mean, you know, when you actually have a nasal infection, you blo- that color. Y'all are going, uh, they were painted with coronavirus. Do you know what I'm saying? (laughs) The stained glass windows were actually stained plastic. And they were blue. Are y'all tracking with me? So far, we got lime green, peach, booger snot, golden blue. And the the choir robes were, were Christmas red. This place was at war with itself. You just walked in and went, yeah. You know, I don't even know what team to get on right now. How'd you do? Wow. It was bad. I looked around. And I said, well, I know what we need to do first. <laughs> and we started fixing things. Because pain ain't expensive. You hear me? And you know what? You know what they make in Hickory? Furniture. You know what I had a whole church full of? upholsterers we upholstered the pews i'd have to pay nobody to do it i said hey dude don't you work at the furniture place yeah you upholster yeah you love doing that yeah i'll bet you got a shop at your house i do you got one of those pneumatic things with an air pump don't you yeah bring it to church (laughs) because i never told you the pews were like this evergreen brown color and so so we just we looked around In your life, you have to do the same thing. Look around and be honest with yourself. What's broken? Where's the wall so broken down that the debris is piled so high you can't, you don't even know where to start? Look around. Secondly, the officials didn't know where I'd gone or what I was doing because I had yet, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews, the priests, or nobles, or officials, or any others who would be doing the work. He had not told them what he was doing, but let me tell you what I think he did. I think he was listening to them. You got to listen to leaders. You got to listen to other people. If this is your life that's broken down, you need to talk to, stay with me. I, I need to explain this, but hear me out. You need to talk and listen to believers as to how to go forward. Now listen to me. I need you to be careful how much advice you take from non-believers. All right. Not because they don't have good advice. Sometimes you get fine advice from non-believers. But I'm here to tell you that if you want to figure out how to build your spiritual life, you better talk to somebody that's got one. All right. You cannot find your way out when you are lost by following somebody just as lost as you are. Talk to some believers and listen to them. Y'all, everybody look up here. Those people that have been nagging you for the past 20 years. They're not nagging you. They're trying to help you because they love you and they know God's got more for you in life than what you're currently finding. Start listening. They may not all be right, but listen to all of them and then ask God to show you which parts you ought to act on. Listen to the leaders. Then it says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. He's told them they were going to rebuild the wall and how God was helping them. Then you've got to enlist the help of others. Everybody hear me. You cannot change your life without help from other people. Everybody hear me. You cannot change yourself by yourself. You're going to have to have other people come alongside you. You say, well, I don't, I don't, don't, nobody's going to come alongside me. Yeah, they will. Because God's never called you anywhere that he didn't give you the help to get where you need to go. 
I'm going to tell you a story um, that changed my life. And when you hear this story, you're going to go, wow, it sure didn't take much, did it, Pastor? Because <laughs> there's not, this, you're, you're, mm. I would love to tell you this is a lightning bolt story from heaven. It's not. All right. But it changed my life. It literally changed my life. I was at the church in Hickory, and I was new. Maybe the first year or two I was there, and I really hadn't figured it all out, and I was trying to figure out how to lead and how to do, and I just didn't know. I, nobody would really taught me that. And so I found out John Maxwell was coming to Charlotte, and I, I signed up, and I went to the John Maxwell Conference. You know, uh, He was a Wesleyan, so I felt good about it, so I went to the John Maxwell Conference. So I'm sitting there, and I'm uncomfortable. I'm not good with crowds. I'm still in that place where literally I did not like being with other people, and I, I was just very insecure the whole time I was there. So I sat myself down in the back, got out of everybody's uh, vision the best I could, and just sat there and listened. And finally, John said, I want to tell you a story about when I went to my first church, little bitty church in Backwoods, Indiana. And I went, wait. He said, yeah, I just started, and, and, and this is how I got started. I thought, oh, oh, oh. This is what I need. So I started writing down. And this is the story he told. He said he showed up at this church, and he said, I didn't know what to do. And I went, I can understand that. And he said, he said so, so, so I, I preached, and I did everything I was supposed to on the weekend, and then I went to a board meeting. He said, I'd never run a board meeting before, so I did what pastors do. I prayed to open the meeting. So that's all he did. He said, and then the, the vice chairman or the lay leader in the church, he sort of took over the meeting and said, all right, well, here's what I think we ought to do. He said, his name was Clyde. He said, Clyde said, I think we ought to. And then Bill seconded him. And everybody voted yes. He said, and then Clyde started talking again. And Clyde said, I think we ought to. And Bill seconded him. And everybody voted yes. He said, then Clyde started talking again. And Bill seconded him. And everybody, he said, I figured out I didn't need but two people to run this church. I needed Clyde and Bill. So he said, what, he said, well, here's what I decided to do. He did not set a meeting with Clyde and tell Clyde what God had said we're going to do. No. He said, I called up Clyde, and Clyde was a farmer. And I said, Clyde, you mind if I come help you on the farm next week? Clyde said, that'd be awesome. What day are you coming? I said, I'll be there Tuesday. Okay. He showed up, and they're baling hay. They're working the fields. They're doing all that. And, and while, they're, while, while they're working that day, at some point, John goes, hey, Clyde. I was walking around the church the other day praying, and um, took a look at that nursery. And I'm a little worried about that nursery. I, I, just, I just, how long has it been since you had a child in that nursery? And he said, oh, it's been years, preacher. I said, well, I, I'm just afraid that nursery's in such bad shape. No parent's ever going to want to put their kid in. Well, Clyde, what do you? What should we do about that? Clyde said, I don't know, but let me think about it. Okay. Came back and worked with him another day and said, hey, Clyde, I was walking around the church outside this time, and I, I looked at the front of the church, and shrubs out there, they're kind of they're they're not cared for, and there's weeds. And, and have you noticed that the paint on the front door is peeling? Pastor, I have not noticed that. I did not look at that. Clyde, what, reckon what we ought to do about that. And he said, well, I don't know, but I'll think about it. Another day, hey, Clyde, Clyde, that kitchen at the church, I, I just, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I'd eat anything out of there. <laughs> I said, well, I hadn't been in there in a while. Let me, I'll, I'll take a look at it. Okay, okay, okay. That was it. Said so next board meeting came around, John said, I wasn't exactly sure what was going to happen. So I walked into the board meeting, and I just prayed and opened up the meeting. And then I looked at Clyde, and he said, Pastor, you should sit down. We've got a lot to do. <laughs> okay. And Clyde goes, y'all, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, that nursery's a mess. Somebody's got to fix that. Hey, hey, Mabel, Mabel, listen to me. You know how to decorate. Can you come up with a plan to decorate? Yes, I can. He said, he said hey, 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 Bill, Bill, you're a painter. Can you paint that thing? Yes, I can. Hey, hey, you do floors, right? Can you do the floors? And Bill seconded it, and everybody voted yes. <laughs> and then Clyde said, all right, well, fine. You know what? That front door out there, I'm going to tell you. I'm, hey, hey, Bob, 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 look at me. Art, don't, you, don't you do landscaping? Yeah, you take care of them shrubs out there. Can you do that? I got it. So somebody's got to paint that front door. I got it. And somebody, Bill seconded, and everybody voted yes. <laughs> and then the kitchen, and everybody voted yes. He said, I never ran a board meeting at that church. But I always worked with Clyde. God has not called you to anything for which he has not provided a Clyde. You just have to find him. You just got to look around 
and listen and then go hang out with Clyde. You see it? I actually went back and tried this. I did. I went back to church. I said, we're going to try this. So I, I, I identified five people that I said, these are the Clydes and Bills. And I got them in the room, and I, and I, and I said, y'all, I'm crazy. I think I'm crazy. They went, what? I said, I got a crazy idea. I just want you to pray with me about it because I, I, I just think it's crazy. We were a church of about 100, and I said, I think we need to hire somebody to help us to expand the ministry. And they said, you're crazy. That church had never hired an assistant pastor before. Oh, that is crazy, Pastor. I said, I, I know, I know, I know, but let's pray about it. So we prayed, and whatever God did with it, I was okay, okay? Whatever God did, I was okay. Don't get the feeling this is manipulative. This is literally testing the water. If God had brought them back, and four weeks later they had said I was still crazy, then I was crazy, okay? But four weeks later, you know what they said? Pastor, we're not sure that's so crazy. I, I think we could do that. We could do this, this, and then we could, yeah, I don't think this, and more we prayed about, it. we got to the board meeting. I did not even have to defend it. They defended me instead of me defending the plan. We got that done in the church group. I need you to know this is not just a role for you to use at work. This is true in your life. When you figure out where the walls are broken down, when you hear from people that can tell you how to live better and you bring them alongside you so that they can help you change, then the supernatural will intersect your natural. And God has already placed the people there who will help you overcome. But you've got to be willing to let it happen. You've got to be willing to let God do it. Some of you have been listening to me the last few weeks and you've been like, no, no. No, 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 no. This stuff is not going to change. This, this concrete around my feet is hardened too much. It's up to my knees now. Oh, but God's put somebody next to you that'll help you break up the concrete. God's already put them in your life. You've just got to surrender to the fact that they're there. You've got to let them help you. You've got to bring them alongside. Be honest with yourself about what's broken. Be serious about hearing advice as to how to fix it and be committed to someone who will help you take the next step. Let me pray with you. Father God, Holy Spirit, speak to us right now. Move in this place. God, you have already placed around us everything we need to become who you made us to be and to accomplish what you made us to do. So Father God, what I ask is that you would reveal to us you would allow us to see what is actually broken, what is actually wrong in our lives. That you would allow us, Lord, to hear from other people who would give us the next steps. And you would allow us, Lord, to surrender to the relationships that will help us move forward. Change who we are. And let us allow you to change how we think what we believe, how we think, how we act. Father God, show us a Clyde and let us learn to surrender to that person's help in our lives. Make us who you, who you created us to be and we will give you praise. In your name we pray. Thank you again for joining us. We hope that this resource helped you in your journey towards knowing God, finding freedom, discovering your purpose, and making an impact. Just so you know a little more about us, we're New Life, a church making a significant impact in every community we serve. We meet every weekend in multiple locations around the Washington, D.C. Metroplex and online several times throughout the week. If you want to connect, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or you can download our app from your favorite app store. You can even watch our services on your Apple TV or Roku. Just search for newlife.live and all of our content will be right there. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe, share it with your friends, or even take a screenshot and share it on your social stories and tag us. Lastly, we just wanted to give a special thanks to those of you who give generously to this ministry. It's because of you that this is possible. If you'd like to learn more about how to partner with us financially, just visit newlife.live slash give for more information. That's newlife.live slash give for more information. We appreciate anything you can do to help. 
Thanks for being a member of our online family. We love making a significant impact with you.